So, hello everyone, and welcome to Python. I conduct these um, I conduct these live lectures for two reasons. One, I think that not everybody is a reading writing learner, and I know that because I'm not a reading writing learner. And I also conduct them because sometimes you just need to ask somebody a question, and I'd like to be able to help in, um, if you guys have any questions. So what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about the very, very basics of Python. We're also going to talk a little bit about Zybooks, and I'm also going to introduce you to PyCharm, which is the outside, the tool that has to be downloaded and put on your computer and will be used for your projects. Um, so we're going to talk about all of that tonight. So we have some new concepts. Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Oh, hi, hello. So we have some concepts. The concepts are, these are again the basics. We have a variable, which is a container for data. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we have a statement, and that's just your instruction to Python. That is a line of code that you are writing, and it instructs Python to do something. A string literal, which is a string enclosed in quotes. It's got to start with a quote and end with a quote. Now, next week it's going to be all about strings, but I just want to bring in the concept of needing to have quotes around the characters for it to be a string. And the Python interpreter. That's the engine. Because what Python does is it takes the code that you write and it converts it into a language that the machine can understand. And then it executes those, those machine commands against the operating system and against the processors so that the computer does something. And we're going to learn about a lot of different some things. But that's basically what the interpreter does. It is a stage between you typing in the commands, you typing in your computer program, and the computer doing something. Okay, so we're also going to have some new functions in Module 1. We're going to have functions. And these two functions you're going to use throughout the remainder of the class. It's input and print. Input is how you get information into a running program. And I'll explain what that is and we'll look at what that is in PyCharm. Print is how you output information to the console. There, these are also how Zybooks is going to inject data into a program and check that your answers are correct. It's going to expect that it's going to be able to input. You're going to use the input function. It's going to be able to drop some data in. And then when all of your processing is done, you're going to pass out this data so that Python, so, so, sorry, so that Zybooks can check your work. So that's one of the reasons those two are so very, very important. Because without them, Zybooks is just going to say you didn't do the right thing. We also have some new operators. Well, symbols. Not all of these are operators. There is a single equal sign. And I will be saying single equal sign for a while. Um, and then in week three, I'll start using double equal sign because there's a difference. The single equal sign means assignment. So I am taking a value and I am associating it with a variable that's, that's an, basically an address in memory. And then there's a pound, which means to Python, don't run this line of code. And it's a comment. So instead of having a line of active code, you're just writing a comment. Now, it's important as an instructor for me to, to understand that you as my student understands what you're doing. So dropping a comment in is good. Just so say things like, you know, and, and this is for your projects. You don't have to do it with Zybooks unless you want to. You know, saying, you know, now no. I am, 
you know, using a while loop as my gameplay loop, something like that. So that's always good, and if, I am, if you're in my class and I'm the one who's grading your work, I always go in and look at your work. So if there's questions or if you want to try and explain what you're doing, it's always good to put them in the comments. We also have arithmetic operators. So basically, you can do math in Python. You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, you can divide, and you can do an exponent. You can also do modula, and there's uh, in week three, we're going to use the floor operator. Um, but these are the standard basic operators. So what is a program? A program is three things. It's input, process, and output. That's it. Every program is exactly the same when it comes to the basics. Now, your input could be from a keyboard, which is what all of our input's going to be. It could be a game console. You know, you're hitting that right button to make sure that the, um, the character is running in the right direction. So that's input. Process is what you're doing with the input. There's some kind of value add. There is the ability to turn your character to the right. That's the value add when you hit that right gameplay button. Um, or it could be determining if valid input was sent to your program if you're doing like we are, all, all going to be textual user interfaces. And output is the result. Output tells you what that value oh, add here. was. Here. So oh, the output could be because that your computer, you know, your character moves to the right. The output could be, you know, the, you know, the weight of a pyramid. I think we have to do that in one of the labs. So that's what it is. Input, process, output. And, and if you keep those three things in mind while you're programming, you will always know what your outline, your general outline is. And this is the beginning of flowcharts. So we're going to have kind of two different non-programming ways of describing a program. The first one is flowcharts, and the second one is pseudocode. And weeks one and week two, I'm going to use flowcharts. And starting week three, because the complexity of the programs and my slides don't, don't handle the, that amount of flowchart, I'll start doing pseudocode. But we'll talk about this. And what you see here is you have, always have a start for a flowchart and an end for a flowchart. Then you have your input, your process, and your output. Now you might have multiple inputs. You might have processes and some inputs. And then you might have multiple outputs. That's all OK. But it still follows the same basic flow. And if you're in my class um, and you have to do the flow chart, which is, I think, the module three assignment, um, these shapes matter. The um, tilted rectangle is for input and output. The, the rectangle that's not tilted is for process. And the start and finish are circle or kind of circles. And then in week three, we'll talk about decisions, which are diamonds. So. This is important. Remember this. And if you're in my class, know that I will take off points if you don't use the right symbols as defined in the rubric. So let's talk about the very first building block. And it's called a variable. A variable is a bucket. It is a place to store data. Computers, every single computer that we currently have on the planet, from a huge Cray computer that has to be super cooled down to my little MacBook. Um, all have only two resources, space and speed. Okay? Space is how much memory you have in your computer to use. And speed is how fast your computer can process the instructions sent to it. 
This class, we do not deal with speed at all. We don't care about speed. It's, it's just a resource that your computer has. What we do care about is space. And we care about space because I believe it's important to understand what's happening in the computer memory while you are writing your code so you can have a better understanding of what's going to happen when it runs. So a variable has a name, it contains a value, and it has a scope. Now everything we're doing in module, in, for module one and module two is in the global scope. So I'm not going to talk about scope a lot. I might put a little thing um, in the programs just to remind you that everything is in the global scope. Module three, we're going to dive deep into scope. But, so it's just a concept to remember that there is something called scope. Scope is where is your code executable? Because sometimes there are places that you can't execute it unless you do something specific. But we will get to that. For right now, if you're thinking about a variable, you're thinking about a bucket that takes up space in memory. Variables have to have a name, and that name has to start with a character. Period. End of sentence. If it doesn't, it's going to be a problem. And variable names cannot include spaces, or special characters. So you can use an underscore, and that's about it. So let's talk for a second about defining a variable. I have a variable called numPeople. I know it is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So if I look at this equal sign, I got a number one to the right, and the num underscore people to the left num underscore people is a variable. This is how you recognize it in Python. So what this variable does, when I, when I write this line of code and then I run it, what happens is the computer carves out some space in RAM. And it carves out the space for the name of the variable. And then it associates that, that name, that variable name, with a value. So I have num people and one. So Python has associated the variable name num people with the value one. And it will stay that way until I change it or until the program stops. Um, variable names cannot be a Python keyword. And in 1.14, you can find a list of keywords. But if you're writing this in PyCharm, you'll get an error. Um, so that's what a variable is, and get comfortable with that because you're going to be using that for the rest of the, the, um, the semester or the, um, the term. So let's see about using a variable. So this is uh, challenge 1.13.2, and it says write a state. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Sorry. I forgot to say something at the very, very beginning. Challenges are not graded. You do not have to complete the challenges. However, my, my suggestion is that it's a good idea to work on the challenges, but they are not graded and you do not have to complete them. And this becomes important, especially down the line when we're working on some big programs and you've got to figure out how to manage your time. So sorry for that aside, but we're going to just do a little program here. And it's going to be, we're going to write a statement that assigns total coins with this, the sum of nickel count and dime count, sample output for 100 nickels and 200 dimes is 300. So we're going to add some stuff together. So here's my Python script. Everything is in the global scope. I have three variables. Even though I got all these lines of code, I only have three variables. Variable one is total coins. That's what's going to be my output. Variable Two is nickel count. And you'll notice to the right of nickel count is not a value. It's int and input. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute. I have dime count, which is the same thing. And then I have nickel, I have total coins again, and I'm assigning it again, which means I can reuse my variable names if I just want to change the value. And then I add nickel count and dime count, and I'm going to output 
total coins. That's what the print statement does. Now, here's a, another rule. Variable names have to be unique. You cannot have two separate variables with the same name. There's only one space in the computer memory for total coins in my program. And if I have that on the left-hand side of a single e a left the left-hand side of a single equal sign twice, the second one's going to be the um, the one that that is going to get used throughout however much of the program is left. So in this case, I've assigned total coins to nickel count and dime count, and then I print total coins. So I'm reusing the variable, which is completely okay. Uh, variable types. There are four types of variables in Python. And a type is just telling Python about how much memory, how, what is the maximum amount of memory I'm going to have to take up for this piece of data that I'm storing. So a string is just an ordered collection of letters, and a string can be pretty much as long as you want. Um, there are some limitations, but there's nothing that you're going to have to worry about in here about string length. An integer is a whole number, which means it does not have a decimal point. Um, and then we have a float, which has a decimal point, and that will always take up more space than an integer. And we have Boolean. I'm not going to talk about it tonight. We start covering that in depth in Module 3. But just remember for Module 1 and Module 2, there are two different, there are three different types of variables, a string, an integer, and a float. And when we do the input, and I'm going to say this several times tonight, when you use the input function, it's always going to bring it in as a string, even if you only type, if you type the number 42 and, and it's coming into your program through an input, it's going to be a string. Um, all variables have a type. The type is determined by the value stored in the variable. Now, unlike Pythons like C and C++ and Java, Python is not a hugely strongly typed language. If I have a, a variable that I've initially set equal to a string, and then later on I set it equal to an integer, Python's not going to care. So you have to be careful. It, it's kind of on you to make sure that you get the right value assigned to the right variable. Okay, I promise we're going to go out and do some, uh, we're going to look at PyCharm in a minute, but I want to explain what a function is. Now, for now, we're going to use functions that Python is providing us. In Module 5, we're going to learn how to write our own. What is a function? A function is a grouping of code that does a specific thing. And you don't have to know what the code, the grouping of code is. All you have to know is what are the expected inputs to that function and what can I expect out of it? What is the function expecting me to give it? And what can I expect when the function is done? And functions are nice because that's code that's already out there. And all the stuff, Python has a lot of functionality, a lot of functions. And it's stuff that you don't have to write. You don't have to write a function to take input from my keyboard or from your game console. Python already has that available to us. You don't have to write the code to output a string to the console. Python already gave us a function called print to do that. So that's what functions are. They're just a group of functionality that does a specific thing that has known input and known output. Um, so functions have a specific format. So every function has a name. Function names are like variable names. You've got to be careful with them. Then there's an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis. Now, you can also have what are called arguments inside those parentheses. You don't have to. The person who defined the function will, will have to tell you whether or not you have to have arguments. 
And arguments are just values that are passed. Okay, you just want to send in a piece of information for a calculation and get that and get something back from the process in that function. At minimum, you have to have a function name, open parenthesis, and close parenthesis. Close parenthesis. So, I'm sorry, I don't know why I did that. I honestly don't know why I did that. I'll fix that. Okay, sometimes we need to convert one type to another. So I have a variable which is, which is type string, and I want it to be an integer, and that's the one you're going to use this week um, for the most part. I don't think you're going to use float, but I know you're going to use int, and you may use stir. So whenever I type in information and send it in, to my Python program, I don't care if I type the number 42 or, you know, pi to the hundredth digit. It's all going to be a string to Python. That's just the way Python works. So then you have to tell it, hey, no, Python, I want this to be an integer because I want to do math. Because you can't do math with a string. So that's why you have functions like int, int takes a string and turns it into an integer. So it gets rid of those quotes and it tells Python, no, this is an integer so I can do math. You can do the same thing with a float. Hey, Python, this is not a string. This is a float so I can do math. And then sometimes you're going to want to compute, com convert an integer or a float to a string because you want to use it to output something. And Python is um, kind of persnickety about what you output. So you have to remember that if you've got an integer and a string that you've got to output in the same line, you're probably going to have to use the stir function. So input function format. Input is a way to get data into the script, as I've already described. Um, and for, all, for what we're doing in this class, it's all going to be from the keyboard. But you have to understand how input works. So input has a function name. It's got the opening and closing parentheses. And the function name is input all underscore, all, all lowercase. Then you have optional arguments, which means you can have an argument, but you don't have to have an argument. And the argument is a string you want to print out to the user. Now, I believe there's one in the labs for module one that you actually have to output. You have to actually put something inside the parentheses for input. But for the most part, in this class, input will always be empty because Zybooks doesn't want to deal with whatever you're putting in there and determining whether or not it's correct. What Zybooks cares about is that the input function is there when it expects, because the return from that function will be data that Zybooks is sending into your running program to do something. And when you're using Zybooks, you know, it'll have those nice examples. You know, if I do this and this, then I expect this. But the problem is, is that that's only the sample. Once you try and run it, it Zybooks is going to stick extra stuff in there. It's going to run your program multiple times, and it's going to stick extra data in there. And so you have to make sure your program works for each set of data that Zybook sends in. And um, so you have to use the input function. Output is the print function. Now, print has got to take at least a string. You have to have one argument. So we have the name of the function is print, all lowercase. I'm going to have an open parenthesis. At minimum, I'm going to have a string. I have an, a second argument that is optional, which is the end. Do you want it to end in a new line, which is default, or do you want it to end in a space? And we're gonna, we'll talk about that a little bit more, and we'll see some examples. I don't think there's anything this week where we have to end it in a space. 
but I know there's something next week. Um, so if there is a second argument, you have to split the arguments using a comma. So an input-output example, and then we're actually going to go look at code. So this is challenge 134, and I have two numbers. I have num1 and num2. And you will see that to the right-hand side of the single equal sign after num1, I have int, input, and then I have opening, closing parentheses after the input, and opening, close, opening parentheses after the int, and one big closing parenthesis. And this is called a compound function call. A compound function call, basically Python lets you use functions as the um, input to other functions. So that would be the same as what you see there. My var equals input, and then num1 equals int my var. Because I want to use int as arithmetic. And to do that, I have to use, sorry, I want to use num1 and num2 as arithmetic. To do that, I have to convert the string that Python's going to give me with input, and there's no option to that. Python will always the result of input is always a string. So I have to do something with that to do arithmetic. And what I have to do is use the int function. So this is input, process, and output. The input are our two input statements. The process is num1 plus num2. And the output is the, the print function. So I have put the process, the calculation, inside the parentheses of the print function. And the way Python works is it's going to go to the, it's going to go into those, um, it, sorry, it's going to go into the parentheses, what's inside the parentheses, and say, what do I do with this? And if it sees two numbers and a plus, what it's going to do is it's going to add them together because it sees two numbers with a plus sign. Um, a rule for print. It can use a string, integer, or float, or Boolean values. However, if there is a string in the print and you want to also use an integer, a float, or a Boolean, you have to convert it using the stir function. Also, your parentheses have to be balanced. For every opening parenthesis in a compound call, you have to have a closing parenthesis. So if you count up your number of parentheses and they are not even, they are odd, then there's, they're not balanced and there's a parenthesis missing somewhere. Okay, now we're going to look at PyCharm. And we're going to look at 3.14. So let me open PyCharm. Oh, I thought I had it. Oh, there it is. I'll just open it real quick. I thought I had it open. I apologize. Uh, okay. Open my cloud. Wait, one. Uh, where is it? Monta one. No. Yeah, is that it? Sorry. Yes. Open. Okay. This is PyCharm. PyCharm is what is called an integrated development environment, and it makes my life. I use integrated development environments every day at work, and they make my programming life so much easier. So what an integrated development environment does is it allows me to view my code and then run it. Oh, I have to add the interpreter so it will actually run it. So this is a Python script. This is the Python script for challenge 1.3.4. And I just have a little comment up here about what the challenge was. So the other thing that I like about um, PyCharm and other IDEs is the fact that I can do what's called debug my code. 
Debugging allows me to see what's happening as the code is being executed. It allows me to see what the variable values are. It allows me to understand if something ha bad has happened because bad things can happen. And I'm going to muck, muck this up in a minute and show you how bad things can happen. So I'm going to execute this line of code. Now this looks very similar to what was on the slide, and it should, except I put in some string there just so we could see how the input function works with something that is there. So I'm going to start. This is, oh, sorry. Don't want to do that. Oh, OK. I don't want to do that either. Current file. All right, so this arrow is the run button. The run button will simply run your program, and it will set it off in memory, and it will expect input, and it will give you some output if it was written correctly. This button is the debugger, and the debugger will stop when I want it to and allow me to evaluate what's happening in the code. Now, um, this will be very useful as you go along because you're going to be writing, starting next week, you're going to be writing things in PyCharm. So you'll want to know how to use it, and as your programs get longer, it becomes easier to make logic errors, and it becomes easier to make other types of errors. So you want to have the ability to look at what's going on. So here I am pressing the debugger. So what has just happened? What has happened is PyCharm has sent this code to the interpreter. And the interpreter is now trying to execute it against the processors on the computer and take up memory. So what, it, what is here is a little red dot. And that dot is a breakpoint. So I can remove the breakpoint by simply clicking to the right of the number, or I can add the breakpoint. What a breakpoint does is it stops the execution of the program before the line that it's on has been executed. So no line has been executed. Now down here, there are two tabs. One is for console, one is for debugger. We'll get back to the debugger in a second, but I'm going to go to console. So here's where I type in. This connected to Py Python debugger and these three arrows in PyCharm means that Python is running. Okay, this code is actually Python's trying to send things to the machine to do something with. So I'm going to step over this. Now you'll see input the first number, which is what was in here. So the input function has been executed, but it's waiting. That's what this little question mark is. It says, I'm waiting for input. So I'm going to input the first number, and that's going to be 42. Now I'm going to move over from this console to the debugger. In the debugger, you will now see num1 equals int 42. So this tells me that Python has carved out a space for the variable num1 and has assigned that variable the value of 42. So I'm now back here. I haven't stepped over line 14 yet. But when I use this little step over button, now Python is trying to execute that code in the computer. So I'm going to input 11. And then I hit the Enter key. So now I'm down here on line 16. And num1, and that's another nice thing about PyCharm, I can just mouse over and it'll tell me the value. So num1 is 42. Num2 is 11. So when I step over this, I'm going to have 53. That was my output. The program has now finished running. And you can tell that in PyCharm because it says process finished. So I've just successfully run a program. And I've done something. I've done my input, and I've done my output. And there was a little process in between with num1 plus num2. So this is, and by the way, get used to PyCharm. 
because one thing that can be frustrating with Zybooks is it doesn't give you the ability to really understand what's going on with your code. And so sometimes I have recommended to students that if they're having a frustration with Zybooks, that they copy their Zybooks into PyCharm and run it independently and see what's going on. So PyCharm is your friend. Uh, okay, so here we go. So a little bit more about print. Um, so these are just some examples of how to do print. And I think I already talked about these as well. Oh, the last one, be careful of the hidden new line. Print will always have a new line unless you tell it not to. So what that means is it's like you hit the enter key on a, on a typewriter. So you went to the next line. That's the same thing that print will do, and that can mess you up in a couple of your, um, I don't think this week, but next week, I think it can mess you up if you're not careful. Um, so print can be called in two different ways. One is with an, um, the hidden new line and one without. And then you can go to, um, this is going to be required for lab 1.23. So there is a lab where um, you need to use that termination character and it will probably be a, in a space and we can look at that. So that's, yeah, that's there. And then here, okay, so this is what's the difference for lab 1.23. I have print word 1 and print word 2. If I looked at the previous slide and I said print word 1 and print word 2 and I didn't have that end as the second argument, what would happen is it would be on two different lines. But um, for lab 1.23, you don't want it on different lines. You want it on the same line. So you need to make sure you use this end. End equal quote space quote will give you a space in between the words and you don't have to worry about um, that new line. So you're going to need that for lab 1.23. Okay, so let's watch example 1.7 in PyCharm. By the way, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if not, I'm just going to jabber on. Okay, so lab, I think I did this before, one point, which one was it? Okay, I'm going to look for one, um, that had the end in it. Nope, that's not it. That's one with format. What did I do here? Okay. Sorry. I don't know which one has it. Uh, print. There we go. We'll just look at this real quick. So this will show you the difference. So I have print hello and print hello again. And then I have a print with hello and then an end with a quote space quote and a print after special end. So if I run this, what you'll see is these two are from these two lines. And this single line is from here and it's because of that end. I don't know why I put 1.7 there. My apologies. Okay, we're just going to keep going. So spaces and cases matter, or cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. I'm used to case-sensitive. I write Java a lot. I write Python a lot. Um, space-delimited drives me crazy, but it's what Python is. So what does this mean? What this means is that uppercase and lowercase are Considered two completely different things. So an uppercase X and a lowercase X are not, in fact, 
X. They are uppercase X and lowercase X. And they will take up two different spaces in the computer RAM. And that's because Python is a case sensitive language. So if you have defined a variable test, all lowercase, in Python, and then later on you type in test with a capital T, E S T, you, and you try and use the test variable that you think you've created, you're going to get an error. And that's because test, all lowercase, is different than test with a capital T at the beginning. It's just the way Python is. Python is also space delimited. And space delimited means that Python figures out when you, what a line is based on the fact that there's a new line at the end of the previous line. So you're going to type in a line of code and then you're going to hit the enter key and you're going to type in a line of code and hit the enter key. And if you don't have that new line in between them, Python is going to give you a syntax error. So here we have x equal 2, y equal 4, two separate lines, we're good. Same thing, x equal 2, y equal 4, but they're on the same line, Python's going to give you a syntax error. It's giving you that syntax error because it is space delimited, and x equal 2, y equal 4 is not a valid statement on a single line because it's going to assume that it's all supposed to be run together, and it won't be. We have some characters that are not visible in, in all computer programming languages. There is something out there called the ASCII table. The ASCII table defines a bunch of characters that are not visible, like a bell. Um, I'm not joking, like a new line, like a tab. You don't see a tab, you just see the fact that the letters are, you know, are pushed to the right. So um, because the ASCII table has a numeric, a hex, and then a character representation, um, it allows computers to handle these special characters that don't show, per se, on the screen. And for example, space has a, rep a numeric representation of 32, and a Python representation is quote, space, quote, because space is, in fact, a string. A tab, numeric representation 9, Python representation backslash t. Same with new line, backslash n. These may become your friend because you may have to do some types of formatting, although not much. Um, your game is where you really have to do any formatting. But it's important to remember that not all characters are visible. Um, yeah, not all characters are visible. How do you handle special characters? Well, the backslash is your friend. And why is that? And that is because, um, like parentheses, quotes have to be uh, balanced. They have to be even. So if you have, well, first of all, if you want to use a backslash, you have to do two backslashes. You have to double backslash. Um, if you want a new line in a, in a line of code, then you would use slash n. But if you wanted to actually display the characters slash n in a print statement, you do slash slash n. Um, Zybooks goes through this really well. It talks about them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'll just be babbling backslash this and backslash that. It's important to understand that Python has this ability. We're going to talk a little bit more about it next week, so I'm really not going to spend any more time on it right now. So lab notes. Um, these labs are intended to be short labs. You're not writing massive amount of code. Really what Zybooks is looking for is it needs to make sure you can create a variable. You can use the input and the print functions. And then I remind everybody, input is how Zybooks interacts with the program to change variable values. 
and print is how Zybooks determines if your program works. And you're going to have it's going to test that you can perform some calculations. When you are using Zybooks, it's going to test the labs with different values. So when you read that problem statement and it gives you those values, those values are just an example. And Python and Zybooks is going to try and inject, just like I was typing in 42 and 11. Zybooks is going to do the same thing, and it's going to rerun your program and send in new input again and again and again to make sure that you did your programming correctly. So you have to use input and you have to use print, and part of the things that drives some people crazy with Zybooks is spaces and tabs matter. So you may have all the calculations done, but if your spaces aren't right, Zybooks isn't going to give you correct all, all the credit for it. If you're in my class, I will always go in and look at your Zybooks labs to make sure that it isn't, isn't just a space issue. If it's just a space issue, I don't take any credit off for it because in my mind that's ridiculous. Um, but so your code has to work with all of the information that Zybooks provides it, not just example information. What we're going to do in this week and in next week is we're going to talk about flowcharts. We're going to talk using flowcharts as our example to talk about the flow of the program. You will have to do a flowchart for this class. Flowcharts are a language agnostic way of showing the logic of how to complete the program successfully. So I'm not writing in um, Python, I'm not writing in Java, I'm not writing in C, I'm writing, I, I'm putting blocks in and they describe the logical flow of the program. So lab 1.9, so let's talk about how to read the labs for a minute. Here it says complete the program to read four variables from input. So I'm going to have four variables and I'm going to use the input statement function four times and store the variable in variables. First name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. You want to name your variables exactly what it's telling to you in here because for this lab, part of the lab is already done. The calculation part is already done. So what you want to do is if you do first underscore name equal input open parenthesis close parenthesis, then what will happen is it will all work with the calculation because that line of code for the calculation Python has already provided. It's not asking you to write. So name your variables exactly what it's telling you on here. First underscore name generic underscore location, whole underscore number, and plural underscore noun. So I'm going to have four inputs, one for first name, one for generic location, one for whole number, and one for plural noun. And then I'm going to output, and the output statement, the print statement is already there for you in Zybooks, which is why it's so important on this particular lab to name your variables correctly. So lab 1.12. So it's going to say a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. Extend the given program as indicated. So you're going to have a variable called usernum and that variable called usernum is going to take input from Zybooks. That input has to be converted into an integer because it's telling you can store a value like an integer. That's Zybook saying expect an int. So you have to use the input function, but then you have to convert it using the int function. And then output the user's input. So basically what they want us to do is they want us to convert the number to an integer and then they want us to, well, sorry, first output the user's input and then output the input squared and cubed. So we're going to convert it to an integer. We're going to square the number. We're going to output the squared number. We're going to cube the number. 
whoops, got my arrows wrong. We're going to cube the number. We're going to output the cube number. Then we're going to get a second user input. And we're going to call that user underscore num2. And we're going to output the sum and the product. So user num2 is going to be another integer. So again, you're going to have user num underscore 2 on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right-hand side, you're going to have the int, open parentheses, input, open parentheses, close parentheses, close parentheses, like I did in that earlier slide. And then you're going to output the sum and the product. So we're going to input the second one. We're going to convert the second one to an integer. We're going to sum user num and user num2. We're going to output the sum. We're going to multiply user num and user num2. And we're going to output the product. And we're going to end the program. So output means to call the print function. If you see that word, it means you're using the print function in some way. OK, lab 1.23. So write a programming using integers, user num, and x as input, and output user num divided by x three times. So this can be a little confusing because of how you have to do, do the division. We know that user num and x are going to be integers. So that means we're going to input them, and we're going to convert them to integers. Then I'm going to divide user num by x. And I'm going to set that into a variable called div. And then I'm going to output div. And then I'm going to say div2 equals div divided by x. So you're not just dividing user num by x. You're um, dividing the product of user num divided by x by x again. So div equals div2 equals div divided by x. I'm going to output div2. And then I'm going to do it a third time. Now it's going to be div3 equals div2 divided by x. I'm going to output that. And then I'm going to end my program. Create two variables and two input function calls. Then you're going to have output three times on this. OK, write a program using inputs, age, weight, heart rate, and time, respectively. Output the average calories burned for a person. Output each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved as follows. So this is your output statement. PyCharm has given it to you. Sorry, Zybooks has given it to you. Now, there are another thing Zybooks has given to you here is the, the word calories. Calories needs to be your final variable name that, that contains the product. So you want to input an age, which is going to be an integer. You're going to input weight, which is going to be an integer. And you're going to input heart rate, which I believe is going to be a float. And then time is going to be an integer. Because um, you're going to convert, heart rate should probably be converted to a float, sorry. So you're going to do all the conversions, and then you're going to calculate the calories. And it gives you that calculation for the calories. And then you're going to output that. Now, what you see here is calories colon open squiggly colon dot 2f close squiggly and then calories dot format calories. So this is a call to the print function. And what we have here is we have a string. And inside that string, in the, inside the curly braces, is a format specifier. That format will basically change, it will basically, for a float, make it two decimal places after the float and no more. And so you have this dot format calories. And this is going, and we'll talk a little bit more about the dot format stuff next week. But the calories is going to be the value from cal 
calories is going to be dropped into where those squiggly things are. So the squiggly things aren't going to print out, but the calories are going to print out in the right format. And then we end. So you're going to create a variable for each of these. Should have let it run. Sorry. And then you're going to use that for the output after you do the calculation. Lab 1.25. So we're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string, storing each into separate variables, then output those four values on a single line separated by a space. This is where we're going to have to make sure that we, um, we use our print function appropriately. So we're going to input all these characters. Sorry, input the float, the character, the string, and the int. And then I'm going to output all of those. Now the nice thing is that I can just, because they're all strings at this point, I can just output them however I want. Now we're going to output them in reverse. And then we're going to convert user int into care using the care function. And the care function is just like the int function. It's just going to take an integer this time, and it's going to output a character. And then we're going to output the character, and then we're going to be done. So you're going to need to create four variables, the names of those variables you can choose. So that is the end of the lecture. Does anyone have any questions at all? Please feel free to open up the mics um, and ask if you have any. Sorry about that. Hi. Hello? Hello. Hi, I'm sorry. I, I have a question about the first lab. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure I was doing it. Um, I, I thought I was able to to put my own name in or, you know what I mean, it, since it was a Mad Lib, but I guess I'm supposed to use the examples or what? I, I didn't really catch that when you were talking about it. Okay, so what we have to do here is you need to use the input function. So if I were going to do this, let, let's go look at an example that uses the input function. Um, what's one that's kind of similar? First name, generic, location. Yeah, um, I'm not... Right. Um, I'm just going to use an example that is similar, hopefully similar, input. Mm -hmm. um, spaces, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I, let me be more clear. What I'm saying is I did put the first name in and the, and the assigned it to and the parentheses and the um, the quotes around a name, but I didn't wasn't sure if I should put Eric Chipotle, twelve cars, or could I put, you know, another name since it's Madly, but I can put anything in there, right? No. I have to put use the example. No. You have to use the input function. So if I take I'm just gonna use this as a um yeah, hold on. Let me get back to it. So let's just say I have first name, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to use this one and just because it's already there. So I have first underscore name. And now mm -hmm. if I did this like that, the only thing the first name would ever be equal to is Eric. I um, see. So what I have to do instead is I have to let Zybooks give me information. And the only way I can do that is to use this function called input. I'm sorry, I can't see. I'm called, I've called in. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So no, it's okay. I but I know what you're talking about, input. The input function. So I would have right. first name on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And then right. on the right-hand side of the single equal sign, I would have input. 
I would have that function call. And that way, Zybooks can send you whatever it wants, and it will send you different information. I see. So if you only put Eric in quotes, you're only ever going to be able to use Eric, and you're not going to get any points for the lab because Zybooks wants to see that you can use that input function. I see. So it would be input, open parentheses, close in parentheses, after yes. the assignment. Yes. That's exactly okay. what it would be. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anybody have any other questions? I'm completely happy to answer them. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Everybody have a wonderful evening. This will be up tomorrow on the YouTube channel. Um, and I hope to see you next week. Talk to you later. Thank you.